By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have reached round number five of the Knights of Thorn in Daventer, the Netherlands. And in that round we're going to see Arthur playing his red and green aggro deck. And he's taking on Bart, and Bart is playing a white and red Rook Egg deck. So it's a deck with Rook Egg, Sarah Angels, and even a Sheevan Dragon. So, I mean, two pretty cool decks, I have to say. So I'm looking forward to see them go uh, face to face. Before I uh, show you the decks, though, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to first go to the games, check out the deck decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below, because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games, so if you click on there, it'll take you to the games. And in that same description below, you can also find more information about the tournament and the rule set. And there's also a link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page, because yes, yes, we have our very own Patreon platform. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks for all the ins and outs. So if you're considering sponsoring the show, if you like what I do and you want to support me, please become a patron of the show. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck decks. I'm going to start with the player on the left, that is Arthur. Let's take a look at his red-green brew. And here we see the deck of Arthur. So at first glance, you're like, okay, this is your red-green aggro deck. But then when you kind of zoom in, you see that he's made some interesting choices. So first of all, a lot of times when you see red-green like this, it ends up being an Urnum Burnum deck. But guess what? There are no Urnum Jins in here. And perhaps it has something to do with all the city in a bottles that we're seeing lately. So there's no Urnum Jin in here. Instead, he's chosen for the Atox, so there are three Atox, and as his bigger creatures, he's got four Suchi. So there are also no Spitting Slugs, for example, here in the deck. We do see the classical inclusion of Curdape, which I always like. Curdape and Green, you know, when you play Red Green, Curdape seems to be a creature that you kind of have to play. It feels so nice there in the woods. Um, and then we, when we look at the rest, that we look at the spells, I'm also seeing something interesting. That is that he's chosen to go for two Ice Storms and one Stone Rain, you know, instead of, for example, going for maybe two Stone Rain, two Ice Storm, or four Ice Storm. No, he's made the choice. One Stone Rain, two Ice Storms, and then also one Blood Moon. You know, so you would think, or you would go for Land Destruction or for Blood Moons, although there is something to say... To, to go like, okay, I'm just going to play a one of Blood Moon. When it hits the board, it's going to be pretty devastating. He is playing multiple Blood Moons in the sideboard, so you can always make that change. But it is kind of interesting to see that, right? And uh, talking about interesting, we also see the inclusion of a Meek Stone, for example. So there are just a lot of, like, one-offs in the deck that kind of make it interesting to play with and perhaps also difficult to play against, you know, because what if you see that Meek Stone turn uh, game one and it has a big impact on the game? You start thinking, oh, he's got more Meek Stones, just start sideboarding differently but there's actually only one there's another one in the sideboard so it could go to two uh meek stone another interesting thing talking about this specific card is that of course it doesn't work together well with suchi it works together well with the other cards but not with suchi of course arthur could decide if the suchi doesn't untap anymore to second or uh, to an atok if it's on the board the nice thing about that is then when you sack the suchi you get four generic mana so you could kind of sync that together time that right with a fireball right you can use that four mana to make a big fireball or maybe even to uh, untap your mana vault for example so there are a lot of like little little funny things that he can do so i'm just curious to see how that's going to work we also see a single berserk in the deck i kind of like berserk as a one-off right because then you, you don't have to build your whole deck around it you, your opponent maybe is not thinking about it and then it comes out of nowhere or your opponent has seen it and has to think about it all the time but there's only one in the deck so i, I kind of like the berserk as a one-off inclusion here um we also see see the avoid fates always curious to see them in action in my own experience i i end up having them in my hand and not really being able to use them um but i mean they should be really good against the deck today because he's playing against uh, white red so there are lightning bolts uh, and there are probably swords to plowshares in there. So that's going to work good for him. Talking about uh, his opponent, let's take a look at the deck of Bart. And here we see the deck of Bart. So it's Red White Rooks. That's the name I gave it because of the four Rook Eggs, of course, in the deck. And Rook Egg, I, I just find this such an interesting card and creature because you end up building decks around it and that's kind of what i love when cards do that to you so rook egg is a card from arabian nights one red and three that reads when rook egg dies create a four four red bird creature token with flying at the beginning of the next end step and uh, it itself is an o3 creature by the way so you want this creature to die funny uh sidestep here is a lot of people think that then the bird comes out of the egg when you kill it but actually it's the mama bird 
that is coming to find out what has happened with her ex, you know? So if you steal the egg, that's what's going to happen. Anyway, um, a cool thing with this is that, for example, when you play a Wrath of God, which is in this deck, you know, your Rook X die, but then of course you get a 4-4 Burt uh, token at the end. So it works together really well with the Wrath, and also it works together quite well with Chain Lightning, because you can Chain Lightning your own Rook egg, and then if you have two red open, you can pay two more red, and then you can target your Chain Lightning elsewhere. So if you then have a second Rook egg, wow, or if you don't, you still can get a lot of value, because you can point it at any other target so that's some really nice synergy we also see an inferno in the deck again goes together quite well with rook egg but they're not only rook eggs in this deck right the deck is more than just that we also see three sarah angels and a shivan dragon so it's it's really you could say the deck is really kind of mid-range right kind of heavy on the casting cost i mean your rook egg is your cheapest creature which is four to cast that means that at the start of the game you have to to stay alive right and in today's matchup for example he's playing against a pretty aggressive deck so that's probably why he's chosen to also play with uh with red and white because that gives you access to four swords to plowshares which is great early game right you can just kill everything on uh, inside kind of try to stay alive long enough to deploy your rook eggs and your sarah angels and kind of take the game from there um he's playing with some more control elements by the way disrupting scepter gem day tome to kind of get that card advantage uh train going also there's a single lantex in the deck i actually like that you know lantex is again one of those cards that people used to uh, used to well not yeah, what I'm trying to explain is people always used to play multiple land taxes if they would play a land tax. And th the result of that choice would be that they would start building around the land tax. But land tax, just as a one-off, is actually really good. You know, if you hit it, it can be useful if you time it right. And then your opponent thinks, oh, oh, he's got a land tax deck, you know, which, which you don't because it's just a one-off and it can still have a lot of value. Talking about one-offs, we also see one spirit link. I think that's also quite good because a lot of decks these days or really these very heavy lean burn decks you know so they've got a lot of cheap burn spells i should say these fast lean burn decks not heavy but fast lean burn decks so that means they're going to try to burn you out really quickly but at a certain point they will run out of gas so if you have a little bit of life gain in that process they're usually going to run out of gas and you can overtake the game so i like this inclusion of that spirit link what i'm a little bit maybe a little bit worried about is that he doesn't have that many targets for the spirit link and of course the spirit link there's always that danger of setting you up for a two for one, you know? So you've got to be careful with Spirit Link, but it could work. I'm curious to see if it can play a role in this uh, matchup. And then also, and this is dissimilar to Arthur, um, a Bartir has made the choice to play one Blood Moon and also Stone Rains. So it's again that combination, just going, you know, I've got one Blood Moon here. Maybe I'm going to use it. Maybe I'm not even going to see it. And then I'm playing with three Stone Rains. In the sideboard, there's also an extra Stone Rain that he can put in. Talking about the sideboard, there's also an extra uh, Spirit Link in there. So that's going to be quite interesting. Um, another thing that I like here are the Sarah Angels. They're going to do quite well against that, that Meek Stone that we talked about earlier of Arthur. So that's not really ideal for him. Um, but yeah, just to sum it up here, it's it looks like a pretty solid list. Uh, what I love is just that it's just two colors. I really enjoy two color lists, just like Arthur's. Uh, I guess because when I started playing in Revised, as soon as I unlocked a duel, as I would call it, I would have a full playset of dual lands. I could build a new deck, right? And it would always be two colors. So that's maybe why I have this affinity for two color decks and mono color decks. That's kind of more in my system than a lot of the five color good stuff decks that we see nowadays. So I'm liking both of these lists, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for bringing it to the show. Talking about that, it is time to go to the match and uh, check out round number five of the Knights of Thorn. Game number one on the right, we have Bart with his red-white Rook Egg deck taking on the red-green deck of Arthur on the left. Let's see what he can do here. Starting with a mountain into a soul ring into a black vice. Okay, that's pretty good. Means probably two damage here for Bart. Exactly dropping to 18. And there's the pass. Now remember, we are playing according to the Swedish rule set, so no mana burn. Tapping two. Are we going to see a disenchant? There's a disenchant on the vice. Interesting. I would be tempted here to go for the Soul Ring. Then again, of course, I don't know what cards uh, Bart has in hand. Perhaps he's got a very slow hand. And he's like, let's get that uh, vice out of here. There's a Pendle Haven. Tapping three. There's an Argovian Pixie. So the 2 1 creature from Antiquities. Very popular because it's so good against the uh, Mishra's factories. There we see another Plains. And there's a pass. So yeah, it is a pretty slow hand here for Bart. 
But I mean, if he can get to land number four, he can potentially play out a rook egg. There's the attack. And there's a swords to plowshare. So that means two life here for Arthur. Gonna go up to uh, 22. And yeah, I'm expecting him to cast something else. Taiga on board, no passing here. I was expecting more creatures. Perhaps a Kurt Ape or an Atok. But it's not happening. And let's see if Bart can find that Rook Egg that we talked about. A little bit uh, in the tank here. Trying to figure out what to do next. There's the land drop. There's a Plains. So three basic planes and a mountain. He's on 18 life and his opponent Arthur is on 22. There's a gem day tome, okay. So he did have a very slow hand with that tome as well. Let's see if it can stick. There's a Kurt Ape and the Kurt Ape is a 2-3 because Arthur has of course the Taiga, which is also a forest. Ooh, that soaring is pretty good. We can kind of see the hand there of uh, Bart. That soaring works so nicely with the gem day tome. And then you can start drawing cards on end step. That's just ideal, right? That's what you want to do in life. Now, if he has, for example, a chain for the uh, Kurt Ape, that would be even better. Yep, there we go. Chain Lightning. Kurt Ape is a goner. And there's the pass. And still enough uh, mana now open for Bart to have that draw on end step. There we see a forest and just a pass. Oof, bad news here for Arthur. Cannot really find anything else. So there's the draw by Bart. Let's see what else is there. I mean, now he's got enough mana as well to potentially cast the Sarah Angel. If he can find a second red, he could even cast that one uh, Sheevan Dragon. We see the hand there, by the way, of uh, Arthur. We see a Fireball in hand and two lands. And now an Avoid Fate. So nothing really for him to work with. All he can do exactly is just pass a turn and watch as Bart is slowly getting more and more card advantage with his Gem de Tome. And this is of course why the Tome is such a good card. You can just sit back and draw some cards with the Tome while you control the board with your direct damage spells and your white control spells like Disenchant and Swords to Plowshares. There's a Sarah Angel. And I wonder if we're going to see the, that fireball being fired off in the turn here of, uh, of Arthur. So Sarah Angel, a 4-4 four, four flyer with Vigilance. It doesn't have to tap when it attacks. And there's also an Atog. So I think he's got enough mana to do both. The question is, does he want to? Perhaps he want to keep um, a green mana open as well for the Avoid Fate to protect the Atog against uh, potential swords to plowshares. So there we see the Atog. Passing the turn here. Okay, interesting. So not using that fireball. There's a Swords to Plowshares. Now he can use the Avoid Fate. Doesn't though. Ooh, I'm a little bit surprised here. I would definitely use the Avoid Fate to protect the Atog. It's such a good counterspell against the Swords, right? There we see Bart now drawing a card. Didn't have enough mana anymore to also draw an extra card with the uh, Tome because he cast his Sarah Angel and Arthur taking four. So he should be on 18 at the moment. Oh, of course he's on 19 because he gained a life from the Swords on the Atok. Yeah, so it makes sense. Anyway, there's the pass. So I'm a little bit puzzled still. Why he didn't use the Avoid Fate? I'm also wondering, is he going to use the Fireball? Perhaps he wants to and hit the Seraph for four and try to change the target as well. Or maybe it's not an Avoid Fate in hand. I mean, that could be the case as well. He is counting his mana though. So he's going to try to do that four on the Angel and four on his opponent. That's exactly what he does. So four on the Sarah Angel and then also four on Bart, I guess. So he's going to drop to 14. He responds. He's first going to draw a card, see if, he's, uh, if he can find something. And that's it. So, I mean, it's it's not too bad, but of course, the, the, the elephant in the room here is that Gem Day Tome. Arthur needs to get rid of that Gem Day Tome. I mean, the longer it sticks, the harder it's going to get. 
Untap, upkeep, and a draw step. Things are looking really good for Bart because of that tome. He's got a grip full of cards. And there we see Arthur only one card, and that's at Avoid Fate. If I'm not mistaken, maybe it's another card, but I thought it was an Avoid Fate. There's a second red. Are we going to see the Shivan Dragon? He's only playing with one, though, but... Would be sweet. Nope, just a pass. So no more gas as well for uh, for Bart. Probably has a handful of answers and lands. There's a second card in hand now. Is it useful? That's the big question. Or is he... Yep, he's just going to pass. So again, he can draw that card. Oh, this is so nice. I'm always super happy when I'm in at a spot where I can just do that. Up, oh, finding a Sarah. Putting it out there. Has to tap another land, though. Exactly. Tapping the mountain. Doesn't matter, but okay. So there's a 4-4 flyer. She's back again. Let's see if Arthur can find another answer. There's a mana vault in hand. I believe the avoid fate. And is that a mox? That looks like an artifact. Looks like a mox ruby. It's hard to see. Anyway, passing the turn. Untap upkeep. Having another draw here. Right, really taking his time here, and I wonder what he was thinking about. There's a strip mine. Not really anything worth stripping here, it seems. And he is stripping the mountain. That's um, I think I wouldn't have done that personally, but to each their own. Okay, there's a stone range. So trying to target the mountains, trying to make sure that the Sarah can survive. Uh, the problem is, I mean, he also has to duel. He's got two mountains still. I mean, does it really matter? So now going for the dual land. Also has that mana vault, so it's, yeah. Another stone rain. Okay, okay, now it's starting to make more sense. So really going for the mountains. I guess if you take care of the mountains, you take care of the direct damage. Oh, there's no void fate to protect the mountain. Oh, that is so funny. That is pretty cool. But I wonder if Avoid Fate also works against Sorceries. Exactly, I don't think so. It's only Instant Interrupt. And uh, you know what? I'll get the card up here because I'm not 100% sure, but I believe it's only Instant and Interrupt that it works on. And here we see the card on your screen. And yes, it only works against an Instant or an Aura card. That's the current Oracle text that we're following here. So that Stone Rain is going to work. And that's also why I was a little bit surprised that he didn't use it on the Swords earlier in the game. But uh, yeah, now of course also Bart knows about the Avoid Fate. So Avoid Fate is already a difficult card. And now if your opponent knows it's in there, it's even it's even more tricky. There's the pass after the attack with the Sarah. There's the Mishra's Factory. And there's the pass turn. Yeah, it's looking really bad here for Arthur. I mean, the only good thing is he's still pretty high up in life. He's got 15, so four more turns if this continues. So he has some time. There's a Hammerheim. You can tap it for red or you can tap it to take away a Landwalk ability. Works really well with uh, Urnum Jin. If you play, for example, an Urnum Burnum deck, could be quite useful. There's a Meek Stone. Yeah, that is so bad here for Arthur. Finding that Meek Stone must be frustrating for him. I mean, the one creature that absolutely doesn't work on as a Angel. There are not that many creatures in old school that have Vigilance, but Sarah, of course, is the most famous one, the most uh, played one of the bunch. A card like Rabbit Wombat, for example, also has Vigilance. But it doesn't see a lot of play. Anyway, there's the attack. There's also a Chain Lightning after, so that means it's going to go down to four. And, oh, there's a Pyrotechnics. Is it called Pyrotechnics, I believe? So that's a four damage a card from Legends, and you can divide it any way you choose. But in this case, it's all coming in towards the direction of Arthur. And, uh, yeah, a little bit unfortunate uh, first game for him. And uh, Bart, of course, had that Jam Day Tome, had so much card advantage. And, you know, his deck is already stronger, I feel, after that mid-game section, you know, then his, then his deck really shines. So Bart winning here game number one. Both players are going to dive into their sideboards and we will catch back up with them in game number two.
Game number two, here we go. So it's one game up here for Bart sitting on the right. That means Arthur is on the play, starting with a Mishra's Factory. Passing the turn, and we can have a little glimpse in his hand. There's the Chaos Orb, Disintegrate, some Lance. Ooh, Soaring Start for Bart, always good. Another Disintegrate there. Playing with more burn, also a Suchi in hand it seems. Gonna tap two, four, yep, there's the Chaos Orb. Passing the turn, I wonder if Bart now has Ooh, and I think I see Wheel of Fortune in Arthur's hand, so he probably wants to empty his hand maybe quickly. It could be a line he could follow and then cast a wheel. Let's first see if Bart has, for example, a Disenchant here for the Chaos Orb. There's a white. That's a good start, I guess, for the Disenchant plan, but he has to have it, though. Another nice card here to play out would be uh, Rook Egg, I guess. We haven't seen a single one yet. I'm really hoping to see those Rooks. Yep, there's a disenchant. That means Chaos Orb here is a goner. And there's the pass turn. So I wonder if you're Arthur now, if you're going to swing in for two. It's risky because you're playing against red, but we've seen the list of Bart and we know he's not playing Lightning Bolts. Which is something you really don't uh, expect. So yeah, let's see what he's going to do. I mean, he's got two Disintegrates. If he wants to empty his hand, he could choose to kind of fire off a Disintegrate for two, but it seems pretty pretty pointless. But then again, yeah, if you really want to play that wheel out eventually. Yeah, passing the turn. I think this is the right decision, to be honest. And I think I probably wouldn't have attacked either with the Mistress Factory because you just really expect your opponent to play with, uh, with Lightning Bolts and you don't want to lose a land at this stage in the game. Tapping five. Okay, are we going to see another Sarah? Oh, there's the Sarah Angel again. Wow. These Sarahs have been really good for Bart. And of course, the Soul Ring really helps to get the Sarah out early. Tapping four here. Okay, there's a Suchi. So, four, four creature from Antiquities. If it dies, you get four mana. And because we're not playing with Mana Burn, that makes the Suchi really good in this format. Still, though, the Suchi is very vulnerable because you can use your creature removal, your artifact removal. And it also has a four toughness, so you can side blast it as well. So in my experience, it's quite vulnerable. Still very good, don't get me wrong. Anyway, there's the strip mine here. So now, I mean, it might be worth it to strip uh, the mountain here. Also because, of course, Arthur's going to get potentially his uh, fifth mana. Exactly, I think this is a really good choice. Oh, look at the hand of Arthur. This strip was great for Bart, but horrible for Arthur. Oh my goodness. Okay, there's the City of Brass. Okay, so it could have been worse. I mean, this is really tough, right? Are you gonna... Yeah, don't play a bolt on that one. Are you going to play City of Brass and then wheel and hope for something to kill the Sarah? Or are you going to be patient and think maybe I'm gonna find another land then I can play a Disintegrate on the Sarah? Ah, he's going to disintegrate the Rook Egg. Yeah, it gets removed from the game, I guess, so that can work. And you do empty your hand. And then he attacks with the Suchi. I like this line. I think this is a good line. For a moment there, I thought that maybe he wanted to, uh, to bolt the Rook Egg. Because when the Rook Egg gets removed from the game, it doesn't go to the graveyard, so that whole 4-4 bird token thing doesn't happen. So this was quite a good move. Also, gave him the ability to attack for 4 and kind of empty his hand a little bit. Also thinking about the wheel. Plateau here, and Disenchant. Yeah, this is what I talked about. You know, Switch is good, but vulnerable. And so many players, uh, you know, play with white here. So you always have swords, always have Disenchant. Then they've got Divine Offerings in their sideboards. It's really tough for the Suchi. Anyway, there's the Jam Day Tome again, talking about tough. Ooh, Lanuar Elves. There are a few things he can do here. He can also consider animating the factory attack. If he blocks, kill it with the Bolt. That could be a line he can follow as well with passing the turn here. I think, but again, it's easy from my you know position here, just sitting in my comfy chair, but I think I would have attacked here with the factory because if Bart blocks and you can bolt it's fine and remember he was also tapped out so there was no chance of for example a disenchant on the on the factory anyway there's the attack with the angel dropping to seven I really hope that the Lanerer elf sticks that he can play this integrate don't destroy it please ah oh, chain lightning really 
Oh, on the life total. Okay, could be worse. Or is it over? Oh, oh, oh no, it's over. <laughs> it's over. Oh man, that is just, that is a big disappointment here. I really was hoping for, for Arthur to make it a 1-1, but it is what it is. Again, another 2-0 here at the Knight of Thorn. We've had quite a lot of those. But uh, that's tournament magic for you, Bart uh, winning here. And I think that strip mine on the mountain was a crucial moment in the game. If he wouldn't have played that, would have been a bit more conservative with the strip, then uh, he would have been in a little bit of trouble. At least the Sarah would have been destroyed probably by the disintegrate. Could have then gone into the wheel and who knows what else would have happened. We would have had an actual game, but hey, it is what it is. Talking about an actual game, uh, we do have a third game between these two players because even though Bart has won this, of course, they decided to, you know what? This went really quickly. We're going to play a third game. And guess what? We're going to go to that third game. Game number three. Here we go. So let's see if Arthur can like show his deck. Show what it wants to do. I mean, there's a lot of elves there. Pendlehaven in hand. Lots of lands though. At least, let's have a look. At least he's got a strip mine, which is basically a spell. And he's got a Mishra's Factory to attack with as well. So it's not, it's not too bad. There's a Mountain by Bart and a Pass. Okay, Atok. Hand's getting better. No artifacts though, but still it's a creature on the board. You can put some pressure on. There's the attack for one. And then the Atok in second main and probably just a pass. Are we going to see a bolt? No, of course not because Bart doesn't have bolts. I keep forgetting that. When I, when I see Red Mountain, I think of Lightning Bolt. I mean, can you blame me? Oh, he's got a discard. So he kept a hand with just one basic. So Sheevan Dragon in the bin. Ah, that's unfortunate. I was still hoping to kind of see a Sheevan. There's a Suchi. There's the attack for one. So Bart here dropping to 18. So the deck is uh, doing what it's supposed to do. There's a Plateau from the top. Tapping two. Are we going to see a Disenchant on the Suchi? We're going to see a Balance. Wow, that is really good. The only downside for Bart, of course, is he's got a discard to hand size there. Arthur having three in hand. But yeah, this Balance is really good. I mean... Bart, I mean, has to discard up to three, but um, this is really good. Arthur here losing three creatures and a land to one balance. That's insane. Let's see what Bart is going to discard. A Rook Egg. And there's a Stone Rain. What else is going to leave? And there's also a uh, Swords to Plowshares. And now Arthur has to rebuild with the hand still full of lands. So losing that one land is not that bad for him. Okay, there's a strip mine. Yeah, this is good. Destroying the plateau, passing the turn. And then he can play that Mishra's Factory to put some pressure on. Ooh, there's a Stone Rain. This is really good. Yes, Stone Rain here. The only difference I would have done here is probably just play out the Mishra's Factory. There's the pass. Because then he could have attacked now already. Another Stone Rain, yeah, really finding the land destruction here. Making it really tough for Bart. Look at that, just passing the turn. That means he can swing in for two. Put Bart here on 16. There he goes. So for a moment after that balance, I was like, hey, wait a minute, is Bart coming back? But the land destruction is very brutal here. At least, oh, this is good. Finding a Library of Alexandria, wow. But this... Black Vice, that's a great answer to the Loa. There's the attack. It's going to go to 14. It's probably going to take 3 from the Vice. Going to drop to 11. Probably, exactly. Pass turn. Going to take Vice damage. How many cards does he have in hand? Oh, okay. Doesn't have enough to have an active Loa. I thought that for a moment. Just taking the 1 damage. Drop to 13. There's a Felwer Stone. There's the pass again. Ooh, Fireball and a Disintegrate. So he's got a lot of firepower there. Gonna put Bart on 11. I mean, those X spells, you don't wanna have too many of them, right? Because you do have to tap out at Sorcery Speed. And I mean, if you look at now at uh, the situation, now Arthur can, can tap out and deal four to Bart, put him on seven. If he cannot attack, let's first see what he's going to do. Tapping three. Are we going to see a stone rain? Yep, stone rain here. On the factory, of course, I guess. Passing the turn. Okay, a new factory. Now he could consider tapping out to play a burn spell. 
I understand he's a little bit in doubt because he's like, yeah, maybe you're going to play a Sarah, but yeah, I think this is a good decision because it's the only play you can really make at the moment. And you're going to just uh, get him low enough. And he's got, of course, that other fireball in hand still, so can bring Bart to three. And if we're going to see a pass here, it would just be kind of tough. Okay, there's a chain lightning. Interesting. So playing this chain, I wonder if that means that he's got a Wheel of Fortune in hand. Okay, there's another land, which is quite good because of that uh, fireball. So now he's a little bit in doubt. Do I want to fire off the fireball? I think in this case, I would wait. Exactly. Passing the turn. There's a plateau. No damage yet for Bart, it seems. So I guess he had four cards in hand, drew into card number five. Tapping four. There's a gem day tome. Okay, this is kind of nice because now he can attack with the factory. Can put him on five and then next turn kill him. Maybe. Oh, he passes to turn here. Exactly. You got to attack, man. Ooh, for a moment there, I thought he passed. Come on, get your victory. You're so close. You've earned it. There's a draw. There's another plateau. Gonna tap four. Is he gonna tap five? So there's a Sarah probably, but that doesn't matter at all. Gonna put him on two with the bolt. And then he's probably gonna end it here with a fireball. Yep, there it is. There's the fireball. So yeah, Arthur, you did it, man. You took a game. That is good. That is good to see. And uh, it usually happens, doesn't it? Um, whenever I play my third game after getting completely beaten up in my first two games, I usually win that third game, which is which is funny. But then, you know, then you're like, now my deck does what it's supposed to do. Why didn't do that earlier, you know? But uh, it is what it is. Anyway, really nice to see this uh, third game, guys. It's always nice to, to have three games instead of two. So thank you for that. And also thank you, uh, the viewer, for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And if you'd like to support the show, please take a moment to like, share, and comment on this. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And then if you're not a subscriber yet, please uh, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Thank you for doing that. And then you will be notified whenever I put a new um, upload on the channel. Talking about that, next week I will uh, bring round number six from the Knights of Thorn to you. So uh, if you don't want to miss that, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And uh, talking about uh, supporting the channel, you can also become a patron of the show via patreon.com slash timmytalks. And uh, the support already starts for just $1. And for that dollar, you get access to the Discord um page of Timmy Talks and also your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee!